Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leslie Schmerler, and I am the director of the Vincent J. Fontana Center for Child Protection of the New York Foundling. I would like to welcome everyone to the second webinar in the ABSAC Fontana Center 2020 webinar series. This presentation is co-sponsored by the International Society for the Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect. This webinar is titled, When Does Poor Parenting Cross Over into psychological maltreatment and is presented by Dr. Marla Bizard. This presentation will be recorded and the PowerPoint will be emailed to everyone after the webinar. There will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. Feel please type your questions in the chat or the Q&A functions and we will answer them at the end. Now I would like to first introduce Janet Rosenzweig, the Executive Director of ABSEC to talk about becoming an ABSEC member and to introduce Heather from IPSCAN and to introduce Dr. Marla Brizard. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you everyone for joining us today. It's a pleasure for APSAC to be co-sponsoring this, of course, with our partner, The Foundling, and ISPICAN, who's been a great partner in so many different projects. Uh, we know today we've got folks that are members of APSAC, that are members of ISPICAN, and folks that are just working in this field and want to take advantage of this opportunity. And we say welcome to everybody. For people who don't know about APSAC, we're the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. We are a multidisciplinary professional society made up of physicians, social workers, psychologists, attorneys, researchers, educators, government officials, all working together to define our roles, to find the best way to work together to prevent, intervene, and treat the maltreatment of children. We are dedicated to strengthening practice through knowledge. We are so committed to bringing the very best in research results to practitioners and doing it in ways to help you support the families and communities that you serve. Today is going to be a very important demonstration of our dedication to that through the excellent presentations we've got. If you are not a member of APSAC and you're interested in joining and taking advantage of our additional training activities, our publications, our extensive offerings to our website, our online course featuring uh, 29 experts speaking on different topics of child maltreatment, I encourage you to consider joining APSAC. And if you do today or this week after uh, viewing this webinar, when you go to join, use the discount code WEBINAR2020 and you'll receive a 20% discount off your first year's membership. We really encourage folks to consider joining APSAC and help strengthening our profession. And I'm delighted to introduce our colleague, our sibling professional society, uh, Heather Heim, who's the Global Training and Development Manager for the International Society for the Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect. Heather. Thank you so much, Janet. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with ISPCAN, I'd like to say a few words. Um, for more than 40 years, ISPCAN has been the only international multidisciplinary organization dedicated to ending child abuse and neglect. We support and connect our members and the global community through our international congresses, our webinars, and other educational resources, our working groups, and our regional networks. We invite you to visit us at ispcan.org to learn more, and please check out our COVID-19 resources page. Thank you for letting us uh, participate today. Well, thank you, Heather. Thank you for your co-sponsorship, and thank you for being here with us today. And now, without further ado, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Marla Broussard. Uh, Dr. Prasad's career has focused on teaching and research with a very special emphasis on the psychological maltreatment of children. Dr. Prasad has offered, authored numerous books, chapters, and other books, delivered and interpreted psychometric testing and assessments to hundreds of people. She's been the principal investigator on research projects and is one of the primary authors on the ABSAC publication, The Investigation and Determination of Suspected Psychological Maltreatment in Children and Adolescents, Our Professional Guidelines. If you're interested in that publication, you can download that for free at, the, at, at our website, absac.org. 
Dr. Broussard is a fellow of the American Psychological Association. She's past president of the Council of Directors of School Psychology Programs, and what's something new to me that I just learned, a member of Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation Research Advisory Board. So, Dr. Broussard, it is our pleasure to turn this over to you. Thank you very much, Janet. It's my pleasure to be here today. Um, these, this is my contact information. Um, I've been working in this area since 1982, and I'm still at it. I think this is a very important topic, and I'm so uh, excited about presenting to other people who care so much about child protection. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators here. Uh, much of this material was that I'm presenting was developed with uh, Amy Baker of the Vincent, Vincent Fontana Center, the New York Foundling, Stuart Hart, um, Professor Emeritus at IUPUI in Indianapolis, uh, one of my former doctoral students, Zoe Cheel, who's at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And I'd also like to acknowledge the definitions, law, and standard work group at the Psychological Maltreatment Summit that was held in Indianapolis in October 2019, and I've listed the members of that uh, committee there. And I'd like to point out that Leslie, who opened this webinar, is one of them. So psychological maltreatment is the most pervasive and widespread of all types of violence against children. It's also called emotional abuse and neglect, mental cruelty, mental violence, emotional harm. It exists in standalone forms and it co-occurs with all forms of child maltreatment. Um, and many of the other forms of child maltreatment also have kind of a psychological message that children take. You know, if somebody hits you, beats you up, um, that has psychological meaning. Um, so it's a very form of mal, a very powerful form of maltreatment. Um, it undermines this child's very sense of who he is and his place in the world. And many professionals don't receive training in it and aren't, don't fully understand how to recognize it and treat it. And even if you're treating other forms of maltreatment, like neglect or sexual abuse, uh, it's important to address any other forms of psychological maltreatment that might have occurred. So thinking of physical abuse, you could get a parent to stop beating a child, but if the parent continues to humiliate the child, the child is still, still going to be suffering from the effects of the humiliation. So all forms of maltreatment are connected. This form is the least understood and the least addressed, and it deserves to be given our full attention. So how do you make a determination whether something is just for parenting or it rises to a level of abuse. I think this is hard for all the determinations that we make. Almost all behavior lies on a continuum and it's deciding where to draw the line that's an important decision. Um, for In almost all decisions we make, when how do we decide that somebody has broken the law? How do we decide if somebody has a mental illness? This is behavior that's on a continuum, and at some point it's a societal decision to where things have really crossed the line. Most parents exhibit less ideal parenting practices, that if they were done at a very high level of intensity or in an extreme form, would be psychological maltreatment. And this makes both psychological maltreatment and neglect particularly hard to deal with. Because a lot of parents don't have sex with their kids, but almost all parents engage in some neglectful or psychologically aggressive behavior. So it, it becomes more of a challenge in deciding when we're going to say someone's crossed the line. The other thing that we need to think about is even low levels of psychological maltreating behavior are related to poor outcomes in longitudinal studies. So both poor parenting and abuse have consequences. So my general answer is that there isn't any bright line. Just as with corporal punishment, which is harmful to children, 
but it isn't considered physical abuse unless you engage in tissue damage. Many common, hurtful, and impairing non-physical parental behaviors are not considered psychological maltreatment in most jurisdictions. Normal parents hit their kids a lot. Normal parents say a lot of psychologically aggressive things to kids. This doesn't mean that children don't suffer as a result of that common adverse parenting. But it also doesn't mean that the behavior has risen to a level that we want to involve uh, child protective services and socially sanction that behavior. But all of this behavior is worth paying attention to. So I would like to basically argue that first, we need to know what psychological maltreatment is in order to identify it and to do something about it. Because in all cases, whether it's poor parenting or it's psychological maltreatment, we want to be able to identify it and we want to be able to do something about it. Whether it crosses the line or not then would determine uh, different reactions that we might have. So how can this training help you? If you're a mandated reporter, I'm hoping it can help you decide when to make a report for psychological maltreatment. Um, bearing in mind that mandated reporters don't have to have conclusive evidence, only a reasonable suspicion. If you're a CPS investigator or you're a prevention worker who works with families that are at high risk of child maltreatment, it can help you identify psychological maltreatment in your caseload, and then your local law would determine uh, how you respond with either a substantiation, investigation and substantiation or a movement to prevention services. I've also targeted this training to the research and policymaker community because I think understanding where parental behavior crosses the line is an extremely important societal issue based on what we have learned about the harmful effects of child maltreatment. Child maltreatment arguably causes the majority of mental health, um, many health, uh, legal infraction sorts of behavior, needing, needing social welfare services, et cetera. It has a huge, huge impact on the morbidity of our populations. And we need to know how to identify it and to treat it. So I'm going to cover very briefly in the time we have together four topics. Just to make sure we're on the same page, I'm going to briefly review the forms of psychological maltreatment. Second, I'm going to just also very briefly touch on the harm caused by psychological maltreatment. And then I'll get to the main topic on that basis, when does poor parenting become psychological maltreatment? So first I'd like to talk, just cover the forms and types. So it was back in 1974 in the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act in the United States that emotional harm was listed as a form of psychological abuse and neglect. Now most parts of the world, most countries in the world have some definition. And part of this is because of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 19 uh, specifically states that mental violence is a form of maltreatment. Not everyone likes the term violence when you're thinking of neglect, emotional neglect, psychological neglect, but nonetheless, that's the term used in the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, which is adopted by all but three countries in the world. Now, because I'm US-based, I'm focused in on uh, US laws, and many countries, I'm thinking of Germany, Canada, maybe Australia, um, have more of a, a federal setup where there may be guidelines from the federal government, but states have a lot of say in terms of how they define maltreatment. So Amy Baker and I recently published a, a paper in Ispican's journal, Child Abuse and Neglect, uh, reviewing US state statutes. And what we found is that most states mention mental and emotional cruelty or abuse in their definitions, but they almost never describe what parental behavior is involved. Even though all the research definitions focus on parental behavior, 
state definitions do not. And Delaware is one of the few states that defines this. So this would mean threats to inflict undue physical or emotional harm or chronic recurring incidents of ridiculing, demeaning, making derogatory remarks or cursing, and then neglect is failing to meet a child's basic emotional needs. So this would be a definition, but it's really rare. Most US states define psychological maltreatment as mental injury. And this means really that if you have mental injury, it could be the result of physical abuse, it could be the result of neglect, sexual abuse. And this is how it's defined. Here's two examples from Maine and Pennsylvania. Maine actually spells out behavioral or personality disorder, mental disorder. They give examples, severe anxiety, depression, or withdrawal, untoward aggressive behavior. And then most definitions include something like seriously delayed development or similar serious dysfunctional behavior. Pennsylvania is generally uh, similar. Should harm be required? That is a question. From a child protective service view, many states and some definitions, you have to have harm in order to justify or to substantiate a case and say that it is psychological maltreatment. Only if harm has already occurred or any reasonable person would say it's likely to occur can you substantiate a case. Now this is not our position. The guidelines in, that we developed, they're endorsed by APSAC, focus on caregiver behaviors that are due or likely to cause psychological harm. And this is because First, we believe that we should be able to prevent, intervene, and treat um, harmful parent-child behaviors and not wait until a child is demonstrably harmed. But it's also because the research base is so strong for identifying parental behaviors that are harmful, that we believe the evidence is so strong that we don't need to wait until a child has been harmed. We can rely on what we know about the great risk of harm that children suffer when they experience these forms of maltreatment. So this is the psychological maltreatment deposition that, that we developed. It's endorsed by APSAC. It's in the APSAC guidelines on psychological maltreatment. And this is, it's defined as a repeated pattern or extreme incidents of caregiver behavior that thwart the child's basic psychological and developmental needs, and convey that a child is worthless, defective, damaged, unloved, unwanted, endangered, primarily useful in meeting another's needs and or expendable. Um, it does not include harm in this definition. Now, there are other definitions and Actually, the degree of agreement across definitions is, is really high. I'd like to point out the really wonderful uh, screening tool developed by ISPCAN called the ICAST, was developed in eight extremely diverse countries around the world, and it identifies five types of emotional abuse. Harm is not required as part of the definition. Um, an excellent highly reliable system is the U.S. National Incident Study, which is very similar to the Canadian Incident Study and the Incident Study of other countries. Uh, eight types of emotional abuse, 11 types of emotional neglect are identified. Um, it has both an endangerment standard, which is this child is very likely to be endangered by parental behavior, and it has a harm standard. Um, this is, is, a, is a reliable system, and it was uh, developed uh, to just track uh, how many cases occur in the United States, both using Child Protective Service workers and sentinels. These are uh, mandated reporters in the community who may, may have not have reported all of their cases. Another system that I want to mention, because I'm going to talk about it later, is the Air Force Family Management System which was developed by Amy Slepp and Rick Heyman um, for the U.S. military. And it has six non-accidental parental behaviors. It constitutes psychological maltreatment if harm is substantiated. And they have very strict guidelines for what constitutes 
arm. Prior to um, getting into each of these six types of psychological maltreatment, which are part of the APSEC definition, um, I want to say that the best way to assess is really to get a, a very good sampling of, of parental behavior, because many behaviors that are really harmful are things that occur repetitively over time and degrade the relationship between parent and child and degrade the child's sense of self-worth and value. However, our legal system and our opportunities to observe um, don't usually afford us that degree of observation. And so this is a debate in terms of definitions that I'll come back to. Do you focus in on pattern of behavior that has to be observed over time? Or do you focus in on acts that can be substantiated, that fit within most legal systems? Something happened that harmed an individual that meets these criteria, and we will socially sanction it. So this is, this is an ongoing debate. It's part of the problem with neglect as well. Neglect is usually seen, you have isolated incidents, but you're also, like if you're emotionally unavailable, that's something that's a pattern. Um, so it can be harder than physical and sexual abuse, which are identified as um, one-time incidents. So here we have the six types of psychological maltreatment that are included in the APSEC definition. The first is spurning, verbal and nonverbal caregiver acts that reject and degrade a child. Here are some examples. So looking disgusted, saying I hate you, saying I wish you were never born, denigrating the child's loved ones, friends, family, pets. Here's an example of a child um, who probably does not feel valued and cared for um, in this picture. And this certainly would be a symptom of a very troubled relationship with a lot of degrading, berating, and spurning of a child. This is an example of a parent making fun of uh, offspring engaging in deep wired dependency be behaviors. These birds are wired to open their beak when the mother comes to the nest. All offspring who are actually raised by parents are hardwired to be dependent. But of course, parenting is a really hard job and all parents at times think like this is just too much. But making fun of children, shaming them for normal dependency behavior, normal emotions and feelings is a form of psychological maltreatment. And then treating a child significantly less well than other siblings. Um, Disney kind of made it as kind of like a character building thing. But this is so painful to children, um, so shameful. Uh, to be treated less well than siblings. Terrorizing is caregiver behaviors that threaten to or do hurt the child or the child's loved ones. Threatening to abandon, commit suicide, expel or disown a child. Allowing a parent to witness the parent harming him or herself or others. Um, telling the child that someone will hurt them when they won't are all examples. Uh, many parents threaten to hit or hurt or abandon and don't follow through. But this doesn't mean that children don't live in chronic fear that this will happen and that their body doesn't gear up as if it's going to happen and if they don't, as if they don't constantly worry that it will happen. A lot of parents think that Situations like this one here are kind of funny, but children are absolutely terrified um, of this type of behavior. Children generally don't like sitting on Santa Claus' lap, um, but often these are things that show up on the internet as, as parents thinking it's kind of amusing. So they're actually making fun of a child for being terrified as well as, as terrifying them. Another example on the internet is where Parents have a child that doesn't eat, so they post videos of the child not eating. And then they post a video of, say, a teddy bear that refuses to eat, acting this out. So they beat up the teddy bear. 
And then when they give the child food to eat, of course, the child eats. So the message is, I'm going to beat you up if you don't comply, which even if the parent never does that, strikes a sense of fear and terror in the child. Isolating is another example. These are caregiver acts that consistently and unreasonably deny the child opportunities to interact with each other. Most people think of this as locking children in closets as a form of punishment. Um, some parents, it, it co-occurs with, um, you know, emotional unresponsiveness where a child may be intended all day in a crib or pay, playpen and only be picked up to be bathed and fed and changed, but otherwise just basically abandoned and isolated. Um, not allowing the child to have friends. These are um, some examples. Uh, this is a joke here. This little fellow won't respond to love. Um, but again, it's using isolation as a punishment and expecting that some a child's going to be transformed rather than maybe giving up on having a relationship, being deeply resentful. Exploiting and corrupting are caregiver acts that encourage the child to develop inappropriate behaviors and attitudes. Corrupting the morals of a child has long been on the books in various state laws. Um, so having a child witness prostitution or forcing and encouraging a child to engage in it, pornography, these would, most states include this under um, sexual abuse. Engaging in criminal activity in front of a child or actually promoting a child, getting them involved, uh, drinking with a child or drinking in front of a child, shooting up, um, modeling, inviting, inciting violence, you know, promoting truancy are all examples that in the past have been called corrupting the morals of a child or a youth. Um, this is an example of an Indonesian four-year-old whose father taught him how to smoke at 18 months, and he was a two-pack a gay smoker already. Um, this is a form of maltreatment here. This comes from a movie, but it shows a child giving up any nurturance of their own and doing whatever it takes to keep the parent happy just in order to have some engagement, um, some sense of caring for parents. And actually, developmental studies have, have shown that parents who are really very emotionally unavailable or can even be quite mean and nasty will sometimes respond much better to one of their children if that child knows how to prop them up. Oh, mother, you look so good with your hair curled. Oh, I love you in that outfit. They basically give themselves over for propping the parent up. Of course, this comes at enormous psychological cost uh, to these young people. But this sort of uh, conscientious caring of the parent um, is, is deeply, deeply um, hurtful to children. Um, but this is sometimes what's required to get any sort of a positive response out of a parent. And this one is funny, but there are parents who live their lives through their child, don't allow their child to choose their own best friend, choose the type of music they like, choose how they wear their hair, um, you know, make all their decisions for them. And uh, sometimes these children, or most of the time these children are very eager to get away. Emotional unresponsiveness is one of the most damaging, particularly early in life. These are caregiver acts that ignore the child's need for attention and affection. Examples, being too busy, too bored, too depressed, too high, too self-involved to pay attention to or respond to the child. Interacting just in terms of care without psychological interaction is just devastating for brain development. Ignoring a child's pleas for help, not comforting them when they're extremely dis distressed. Not spending any time with them, demonstrating no affection. These are really, really hurtful. This cartoon shows a parent, yeah, yeah, I'm listening to you. You want me to pay you more attention, blah, blah, blah. The parent that recognized the child wants this from her, but the impression is she has no intention of, of giving it to this kind of lost little boy. 
who's able to articulate his needs. And the final one, and these are often included under neglect statutes, but this is mental, medical, mental health and educational neglect. So this is your kid attempts suicide, you don't take them for help, you just say they're manipulating. Um, you, your child is failing in school, and even though free tutoring and intervention is available, or they're offering special education services and you can't be bothered <clears throat> to sign the form, or your child has um, likely has a hearing problem, you can't get your child in to get hearing aids or get them to speech therapy um, or offer treatment for basic medical care if, if you have the means. All of these constitute um, another form of, of psychological maltreatment. So in that quick tour through the definition, uh, the basic takeaways is we endorse this definition. It identifies uh, parent, uh, psychological maltreatment. The actual definition is much more detailed. But there are six major types. Each type has sub-examples. And the definition um, identifies parental behavior. There is no harm standard required. As I mentioned, most governmental jurisdictions require harm. So section two, which we'll go through very quickly, is harm caused by psychological maltreatment. As I mentioned before, this is how we decided um, that parental behavior would be enough because of the voluminous literature um, that's available on harm. This is research that's been done um, really for the past hundred years on parental behavior by anthropologists, sociologists, social workers, psychologists, and some physicians. And what we know is that maltreated children all over the world have significantly more problems um, over the lifespan than non-maltreated children. And this is in terms of physical health problems, how long you live, mental health problems, um, whether you need social services, um, any type of additional supports or evidence of uh, not meeting normal, typical age-appropriate behavior are dramatically increased um, if you are a victim of child maltreatment. And the other thing we know is that all forms of maltreatment are bad for children to the point that some researchers are now saying, let's don't even talk about different forms of, of maltreatment. Let's teach, treat them all the same because they're all bad and they seem to be equivalently bad. Now, this, I still think there's merit in looking at the unique effects um, because we have found each form seems to have some unique effects. Now, what I mean by this is not this form causes this, this form causes that. All forms seem to make children more vulnerable to psychopathology. And I'm thinking here both in terms of mental health, mental health learning problems, health problems broadly defined. But they do show unique patterns that I think are worth looking at, particularly when we want to understand mechanisms for what's causing the different types of harm. So what are the unique effects of uh, psychological maltreatment? This is very brief, but these are five areas that have been identified if you look at, at studies. And the, the data here come from studies where children have been followed from childhood into adulthood. Some of them have been genetically informed, twin studies, cross-sectional studies, retrospective studies, um, all of them have support from longitudinal studies, but also from uh, cross-sectional studies. So even when you take into consideration other forms of child maltreatment, other forms of adversity and household dysfunction, psychological maltreatment seems to be particularly potent above and beyond for these types. The first one is depression and suicidality, um, emotional abuse and neglect, have proven to be the most potent. And this is particularly true for treatment-resistant depression. 
Conduct disorders. This is a combination of physical and psychological abuse. Make people much more likely to get in trouble with the law, engage in violent behavior, uh, domestic violence, interpersonal aggression, um, and develop substance abuse disorders, and sexually risk-taking behaviors. Thought problems. A lot of people working in child maltreatment think that the high prevalence of thought problems may be a trauma reaction. But above and beyond other forms of maltreatment, being psychologically abused uh, is related to having more hallucinations, more dissociation, more diagnosis for schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. Cognitive decline. In infancy and low cognitive functioning throughout the lifespan are uh, cognitive declines in infancy is, is related to um, basically emotional neglect. It's where um, kind of psychologically unavailable caregiving is just devastating to the developing brain. Children need a relationship to develop uh, species appropriate social and cognitive ability. And then low cognitive functioning on any way you want to measure it throughout the lifespan is related to psychological neglect and physical neglect, but not psychological abuse. And then the last one, physical health problems. It's been tied to being shorter, shorter uh, height in adulthood, asthma. The one that I find most amazing, and you might as well, uh, comes from a, a recent study published um, by Japanese authors using their 80,000 mother-child uh, dyad representative sample of Japanese parents looking at environmental factors that influence development. And after they controlled for 16 things that might be related to hearing loss, in, um, they found that verbal abuse of a mother by her partner during pregnancy, but not physical abuse, was significantly associated with a hearing referral for the infant after two failed hearing screenings in the first week of life. Um, that's really an amazing finding. And uh, studies like this come out all of the time. So the moral here is really all forms of child maltreatment are devastating. Um, and particularly the longer they go on, the more severe they are, the more forms of maltreatment you experience, the longer period of time that you experience them, all are related to kind of a dosage effect. So the bottom line is the research on psychological maltreatment is extensive, international, high quality, and it supports the existence of a causal relationship between psychological maltreatment and negative outcomes. Um, and there are five domains of uniquely greater harm. So now I want to turn with that background, that very brief background, when is it psychological maltreatment? When do we cross the line? Okay, so I think right now I've made the case for what it is based on the research literature. And it doesn't, if you use any of these research and professional definitions, and I've outlined a few here, the APSEC definition I've spent the most time on, if you use ICAST, if you use the NIST 4 definition, the Canadian incident study, um, all of those definitions give very clear guidance as to what is um, psychological maltreatment. And they can be used reliably to modify maltreatment classification system by Jody Todd Manley, Dante Cicchetti, and Doug Burnett is another one that's been used widely to code child protective service records. Um, all of these systems can be used reliably to identify psychological maltreatment. We know what it is, and the agreement is extremely high. The issue is what can be substantiated. That is a totally different issue. This is the issue of not what is it, but does your county, country, or state law support? This should be country, not county. Um, does your, does the laws that you operate under, can you substantiate a case? So what I want to do right now is to kind of walk through this. Basically, if you know what it is, 
and you know what the law is in your state, in your country, in the U.S. military, wherever you happen to be practicing, and you know what's inquired to meet that standard, then you know what to do. Um, you know what the behavior is, you know what the standard is needed. And after I talk about U.S. Air Force family management approach, I'll talk about approach to whatever jurisdiction you're in, gathering information in order to A, make a, a, investigate and make a case that psychological maltreatment exists and it meets guidelines of your state, or to examine a case, note that it exists, identify what risk and protective factors are important for treatment, and identify harm so that people can design treatment, whether it's uh, mandated treatment or voluntarily preventive services, or whether you're seeing someone for psychotherapy, there is guidance along those lines. But this is what people need to know. What is it and what can be substantiated? You need to know the laws where you're operating. Now, I think we need, ideally, and this is where the research policy part comes in, is because one of the things we've learned is that child maltreatment is one of the worst things, the most powerful things that turns people's lives off course in a negative direction. And yet we have no agreed upon standards that operate in a way that we can look across, say an entire country or even better the world and in a comparable way, identify child maltreatment, including the different forms and including psychological maltreatment. And this is absolutely critical if we're going to do surveillance if we're going to make decisions by governments on how to allocate resources, and if we're going to evaluate whether any of our societal level interventions are making a difference, we have to have good data that's regularly collected. So to that end, I want to bring to your attention the Air Force Family Maltreatment definitions developed by Rick Heyman and Amy Slepp over 15 plus years with the U.S. Department of Defense it comes under many titles, but I'm calling it the Air Force Family Maltreatment Definitions because that's one of the titles. And they have, through very rigorous piloting and field testing, developed a categorical model that's kind of like an ICD-11, DSM-5 sort of format, and it may end up being an ICD-11. Um, it has specific criteria for parental behavior. It's verbal or symbolic. And it has to demonstrate high potential, very high standard for harm or actual harm. So what does this definition consist of? Well, spurning, berating, disparaging, scapegoating, humiliating, terrorizing, threatening a child, harm them, their loved ones, abandon them, sexually assault them, uh, abandon people, et cetera, confining through binding a child, locking them in the closet, coercing them to inflict pain on themselves. A lot of definitions might consider this physical abuse, like making a kid kneel on rice. And then uh, disciplining them excessively, either psychologically or physically, but not to a physical abuse level. Now, the standards for harm are strict. Um, and this is something that they worked on for a long period of time. So you have to have demonstrable psychological harm. It, so the first could be a more than inconsequential fear reaction. So this could be a kid in their play, repeatedly saying something like, daddy's going to kill me, or, um, you know, you need to die, I wish you were aborted. Or somebody could verbalize their fear and distress. And you need to have um, fear reaction that lasts at least 48 hours, like sleep disruption, irritability, other signs of kind of fear and anxiety that, that if more pronounced, might end up in a PS, PTSD um, uh, criteria. The second way you can establish psychological harm is if somebody shows significant distress that is it either just misses or is meets diagnostic thresholds for PTSD, major depressive disorder, or acute stress disorder. So as I said, they have clear criteria here, but it's strict. Um, you can also demonstrate potential psychological harm that a child's going to develop a psychiatric disorder, 
um, or have a disruption in psychological, social, or cognitive development. I'm going to present a case in a minute that where there's a lot of evidence that a kid is at risk for uh, major depressive disorder and also very strong evidence of uh, cognitive, psychological, social delays. And then the third area of harm is if you have stress-related somatic symptoms that interfere with normal development. So this could be, um, you know, developing ulcers, headaches, um, a lot of kids somaticize and um, stress-related symptoms along these lines would, would meet their criteria. Um, they were able, by increasingly becoming more clear and, or, and stringent, um, able to get over 90% agreement between experts, that was their team, and actual field investigators in 41 military uh, units. And the, the field investigators would be like a social worker, some sort of a clinician, the work supervisor, which would be the head officer. And um, I'm blanking now on the other person in those teams. These definitions had very strong specificity. They could identify who has it, pick up who has it, and also uh, sensitive, excuse me, very good specificity, good at identifying who doesn't have it, and sensitivity, identifying who does have it. Social workers reported that it was easy to learn and apply, and they felt it was fair to the alleged offenders and the victims. And then the rate of one-year substantiated reoffenses dropped in half which they suggested that having a bright line in the sand was really helpful for parents in knowing what crossed the line and preventing new cases. The limitations is they admitted emotional neglect altogether, and that is without question one of the most devastating forms of psychological maltreatment. And they also didn't include any forms of exploiting and corrupting. Um, you need a mental health professional to assess whether DSM thresholds for psychiatric illness are met. And they focused on acts, not on a pattern of behavior. And this is really a measurement issue. They could not get any agreement for psychological maltreatment if they focused on patterns. People just didn't have enough information and they had disagreements of what constituted a pattern. So they ended up focusing on acts that resulted in clear harm. And by doing so, they got over 90% agreement, the same level as with physical and sexual abuse. So, from a policy perspective, um, Amy Slepp is, is working with us um, and right now the state of Indiana and the APSAC Policy Center to try to develop a model law um, based on the Air Force guidelines, but of course expanding it to be more comprehensive include other forms that are in the APSAC uh, definition. So I think that's extremely important um, in terms of our work going forward. I'd like to end by giving you guidance on a strategy for identifying psychological maltreatment that will help you in making decisions about cases regardless of the type of practice that you have if you're working with cases. And this is in the APSAC guidelines, which are available on the website. We have these worksheets and we have a case example for pulling together evidence of psychological maltreatment. It breaks it down in terms of every form, supportive evidence, disconfirming evidence. It's designed to be used with all sources of information. You don't need a mental health person to do the evaluation unless that was really the only source of information that you have, but usually people have collateral, you know, they have neighbors, they have parents, they have daycare people, they have school professionals, and certainly once kids are in school, schools all have social workers and school psychologists, at least um, in most of the first world. And those individuals have the skills to do um, assessments of how well kids are doing psychologically and in terms of their learning, and then just reviewing school records can be useful. So we have worksheets for psychological maltreatment, for risk factors and protective factors because they're critical for, for treatment. You need to know if there's a good school system, there's other resources that are available, if there's somebody in jail, if there's substance abuse, et cetera, and then pulling together evidence of harm. 
So an example here is uh, a boy age 10, one of five children born to a married couple. The information came from interviews with mom, dad, the school personnel, a review of his school records, and a talk with his doctor. Basically, he'd been reported because um, he was being assessed by a school psychologist. Uh, he was already receiving social work services for kind of depression. Um, but he had, you know, missed much of first grade because of uh, asthma, which didn't end up as a, a neglect report, and it should have. Um, but in any case, he was evaluated because he wasn't learning, even though he had normal intellectual ability. Um, he was seeing the social worker because of mental health problems. Um, he couldn't remember things that he had mastered previously. His mind wasn't in his schoolwork. He was very immature and silly. Um, the evidence for psychological maltreatment came from interviews with his mother, father, and he. They all reported that the father frequently used degrading language. Um, and the boys were afraid of their dad. He singled them out for worse treatment than their sisters, so there was kind of a Cinderella thing going on. He blamed them for their poor treatment. The mother made many realistic threats of suicide. She had made had three previous attempts. She was currently depressed. She was seeing a psychiatrist. She would frequently say, you'd be better if I was dead. I'm such a bad mother. The dad was a scary guy. Um, both parents had a maltreatment background, but he had a lot of guns. He would get into fights with the neighbors. He put attractive boulders around the house because he was worried some somebody might, a neighbor, for example, might drive a truck into the house. And he had cameras all through the house uh, monitoring children's every move. And emotionally unresponsive, the mother was only affectionate to the boy when he was in, basically she thought he was going to die. That was usually when he had an asthma attack and they were either driving him or he was in an ambulance going to the hospital. Uh, and father was never affectionate. Evidence for harm was that he was two years behind grade level, even though he has normal intellectual ability. He was attending the good school system. He was receiving special education services for mood, learning, behavior problems, all documented in IEPs and reports. He was being seen by the social worker, school psychologist to assess depressed mood, thoughts of suicide, negative cognitive style, low self-esteem had problems relating to others at school. Um, he was doing very poorly academically. And then um, his doctor reported that there was poor home management of his asthma, even though he had good medical care. For three times a year, he was being hospitalized. So this was the evidence of harm that was pulled together without getting independent clinicians to do uh, an evaluation. So this is a format that really can be used with any case. So in conclusion, I think all the major definitions are good. They're based on a mountain of high quality observational work, much of it longitudinal. They agree with one another. Uh, the NIS, US NIS 4 and the EPSEC guideline are the most comprehensive. In terms of going forward and trying to create a way to adopt common definitions so that we can inform policy decisions, I think it makes sense to build on the Air Force definitions. Um, and, but it, to expand them to include um, other forms of psychological maltreatment. In terms of the harm standard, my colleagues and I really don't think a harm we prefer that psychological maltreatment focused on parental behavior and was treated like sexual abuse where no evidence of harm is needed because everybody agrees it's bad. Psychological maltreatment like physical abuse um, requires evidence of harm or high likelihood of harm. That is the current social consensus. I hope it will change, but that's really what we're dealing with right now. Consequently, if we're going to, to um, try to develop a model law, the Air Force model makes sense, but um, anyone can use the APSAC guidelines to create an assessment framework to make a case for uh, both substantiation and for treatment in one's jurisdictions, but of course you need to know the local laws. The last point I want to address is that who should assess psychological maltreatment? Some jurisdictions have very stringent standards for who can assess harm and tie it to parental behavior. And this severely limits who can be identified as having psychological maltreatment. I was working with a, a state 20 years ago that where there was very little uptake 
for um, nobody went to daycare, nobody went to preschool at that point in time in this state. It was one of the poorest U.S. states. And so consequently, <clears throat> psychological maltreat and people didn't have budgets for um, mental health professionals. So consequently, children could not be substantiated for uh, psychological abuse and neglect until they started school. The state would accept uh, psychological evaluations by the school psychologist, by the school social worker, using some, you know, well-validated behavior ratings indicating, you know, depression, anxiety, et cetera, other types of evaluation, decrements in social functioning and learning, but only when kids could start school. So that meant that early intervention was completely out of the picture kids who had chronic psychological abuse and neglect at that point were really impaired by the time they started school. But this is the case. Other states, they require very high levels of uh, training in order to substantiate cases. My personal opinion, and I don't know the views of my past collaborators, but I believe that if we're ever going to deal with psychological maltreating behaviors, uh, we have to have care workers, case workers trained to do this. And I believe if we have rigorous training with ongoing group supervision, decision making about cases, and the availability of licensed mental health professionals um, when needed, that's the way to go. This is a model used all around the world. Um, I work closely with someone who directs global mental health projects, working with it, you know, not really educated at all but uh, interpersonally gifted individuals who provide treatment for people that are depressed in refugee camps and all sorts of adverse settings. And they're supervised once a week and they call in if there's real problems with suicidality. But um, we have to make this something that can be routinely assessed if we're going to make a difference. And the difference we wanna make is that we wanna protect children who are being harmed. And we also wanna guide treatment and get Parents help in becoming better parents, and we want to uh, make sure that children receiving treatment are treated for all the traumas that they have experienced. And that's it. I'm open for questions in the remaining three minutes, and I'm willing to stay on the line to ask questions. Thank you so much, Marla. Um, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. We had a lot of questions, and like I said before, we. Like Marla just said, we are going to stay a little bit after. Um, if you can't make it, we will send you over a recording of the webinar so you'll see everything that we missed. And um, we're going to start with a question right now. Um, a couple people were asking. Um, a couple people were asking, what tools do you use to document PM and its severity? You kind of answered that with the last one, but is there any in particular that you use? Well, I, I am a big believer in, in just real world data. Um, and this is where, as I said, you know, getting reports from, you know, people that are trained and experienced looking across wide groups of children, you know, daycare people, uh, school professionals, you know, experienced teachers know what's normal and what's abnormal. So when you have kids that are not learning, they are not mentally retarded, but they're, they're basically learning at a very reduced level, or they're completely unable to concentrate, or you see a major change in behavior and you get some idea of what that might be, maybe an, a new a boyfriend, a new stepmother, a big change in, you know, dad lost his job, you know, things like this, and you get a big change in behavior. Um, looking at kids' grades, are they placed in special education? Um, usually there are evaluations then of, of kids' mental health that can be used, but you can also give well-validated behavior rating scales to, to teachers to fill out, like the Achenbach Be Child Behavior Checklist or the Behavioral Assessment System for Children, third edition. Um, these are routine measures that are available, and they all provide information on mental health and behavioral functioning. Um, you know, juvenile justice records, et cetera. I think this real, real world data is, is what's most important. And again, you want to be able to establish a pattern. Some kids continuously live in this type of environment, but for many kids, there's a big change. And then you see this marked change in behavior. Thank you so much. Um, a couple of people also actually asked, uh, what are thought problems? They never heard the term before. 
Well, a lot of people think of this as just craziness. Um, thought problems is a non-pejorative way of saying you hear voices. Um, you see things that other people don't see. You hear voices that other people don't hear. You have moments when you can't remember how you got into a certain situation. You're kind of blanking out in terms of what's gone on for a period of time. Um, you know, all the, all the way to full-blown psychotic uh, disorders where you're seeing bizarre things, um, hearing bizarre things, things that are outside the normal realm of, of uh, human experience. Those would all be under the broad category of thought problems. And maltreated kids have higher levels of this. For a lot of kids, it's just hearing angry voices. Um, but, you know, it, it moves into, in some cases, you know, they have a really increased level of dissociating and then more severe disorders as well. Thank you. Um, somebody just asked, which I'm curious about as well, um, what is your experience in working with children with disabilities and identifying the signs of PM? Well, that's a really good question because um, in my own studies, I have found a remarkable high level of special education placement, um, which has also been found in the NIST uh, disabled. It, the, the data on dis, there's, it's a mixed level in terms of uh, if you look at, at do disabled kids get more maltreated? I guess that's not the question you're asking me. The, the data is kind of mixed there. They, in particular, disabled children are most vulnerable to severe emotional neglect on the part of parents. But you're asking Thank a little different question. Does that answer your question? Or are you asking me something different about dealing with disabled kids? Um, I think I, it's somebody else's question, but I think you helped get a little bit closer to the point for that one. OK. Um, so another question that we have here is, what, do you, what would you consider the most effective um, treatment for post-traumatic stress with it or for PM after, like for post-traumatic stress with PM and harmful behaviors? I am not an expert on treatment, so I, I would have to pass on that. Um, we actually have some treatment webinars coming up, so yeah, hopefully I we can help you on that. I, I do not, I'm really an, an assessment and research person um, and not a treatment person. So I would, I'm glad you have treatment, treat, that's a good question, but I'm glad you're having treatment webinars coming up. Yes, we do, we do. Um, so another question I have here, and I'm throwing a lot at you. Um, so well, one is pretty easy. Is there, a, do you have a reference for the study that you mentioned about the hearing loss? Um, and if so, maybe we can include that. Yes, I took off the PowerPoint all of the long uh, references. But yes, I have a reference for everything. And if you get the APSAC monograph on um, psychological maltreatment, it has all the references. But this one came from an article in Child Abuse and neglect, and I'm trying to see if I can find a, um, yeah, I don't have the author right here in my notes, but yes, I can supply the reference. Maybe we can include that on the PowerPoint we send to everything, Absolutely. everybody. Absolutely. Um, you said that, so you mentioned before memory loss and brain damage for kids who have experienced PM. Has there been any studies or has it been shown a way to restore that memory loss with therapy or training? Um, I, I don't remember talking about memory loss per se. Yeah, what somebody said here I mean, it, kids that experience kind of in early childhood, like um, emotional neglect, um, are very prone to having lower intellectual ability, doing poorly in school. Um, it, as adults, they have poor memory, significantly poor memory. There's a whole host of longitudinal studies with well-documented forms of, of maltreatment in childhood following people into adulthood, and they do have poor memory, poor executive functioning, poor ability to learn. But I, I don't have any data on memory problems in children if that's the question. Yes. Okay. So 
we'll do that one or two more questions. One more that just popped up is um, they're wondering if when it comes to adolescents in their developmental stage, how to discern what may be parent-child conflict that is normal for that stage um, and when it can lead to cross over into emotional harm or psychological maltreatment. Yeah, so that is, boy, that is the thousand dollar question. <laughs> um, I, I say that because, um, you know, it can be, it can be a tough period of time, particularly if both parent and child tend to um, have more troubles with emotional regulation. Um, so it can it can be more stressful. It's also the case if children have been uh, have a long history of maltreatment, they can often become much more oppositional and angry and aggressive, um, and can be abusive towards the parent. Um, so I can't give a hard and um, a hard bright line to how to distinguish. Uh, those sorts of things, but I I think that's something that probably getting a good history, um, having a clear understanding of of what the the um, concerns are about, um, can kind of inform the situation. But clearly, um, some individuals maybe because they're developing mental health problems, maybe there was poor parenting but not clear maltreatment. Um, you know, some adolescents can become abusive to their parents as well. So I, I think it requires an openness to uh, trying to make sense of the whole situation and making the best possible uh, decisions based on that. I don't have a quick answer. Perfect, thank you. Um, I guess we'll end with this question. When it comes to some of the research studies that you talked about, what is the success rate of the cases, the PM cases with these studies um, that you talked about? I'm assuming when it says success rate, they mean the success rate in um, in being able to dis distinguish PM cases. Well, the success rate um, with both the National Incidence Study, um, the the if you're talking about how how good are people at agreeing upon a decision, um, which is is what the data we have. It's not like we have. Um, like gold standard identified cases, and then we see how well trainers do. What we have is is people that know the guidelines or the, the definitions really well, and then they see how other people can apply them. Um, and the all these major decisions can have very high levels of agreement. Um, the different definitional systems, in particular the Air Force One and the NIST, um, but both of them have very careful training approaches, but you can get high levels of agreement between experts and people in the field and people in the field working together. Um, that's something you could have a, you know, a whole training on. But yeah. these, are, these are decisions that people can agree upon. If that's the question, that would be my answer. Perfect. There are a lot of questions, but I, we do not have time to get to all of them today, but hopefully we'll have more PM workshops in the future. Thank you so much, Marla. I really appreciate your Good presentation. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And you'll be getting an email in the next week with the, with the PowerPoint and the recording.